Welcome to Law Chat with Gerja, my entrepreneur friends. I'm Gerja Parga Patel, and I'm a mother, a wife, a daughter, a sister, a businesswoman, a lawyer, and an entrepreneur just like you. I believe in the power of storytelling and mentorship through stories. Whether six months in or 20 years in their journey, entrepreneurs have impactful experiences to share, which are full of mistakes and full of victories. And my goal is to highlight those and to celebrate the diverse narratives and perspectives in the world of entrepreneurship, which inevitably provides motivation, encouragement, and inspiration to our community and to our own journey. So Lacha's purpose is not just to share the expected conversations about their businesses and journey, but also I want to share and dive deep into their details, get nosy, get personal, and learn from their pivotal journey and their mistakes, and also, again, their victories. So I'm here to use those moments to inspire and to motivate you on your own journey. And of course, we can't run away from the law. After all, this is Law Chat with Gerja. So let's dive in. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Law Chat with Gerja. I am so excited because I have the privilege of having Francesca McCon on today's episode. I have known Francesca for a few years now, and we have built this beautiful business relationship. And it's so amazing to have her by my side and by my corner as well. She's dynamic. She's a wife. She's a mom of Siamese cats, an entrepreneur, <laughs> a serial business builder, and a go-getter, and truly exemplifies the Enneagram 3 an achiever. She has raised the bar in her floral design business, and she has also raised the bar in her new coaching business as well. She has a passion to live her life, a life that she loves, and to build a lifestyle that she can passionately live. And now she is transferring that passion off to others and allowing them and helping them also to live a life that they love and to build a lifestyle that they love. And so without further ado, I welcome Francesca to the show. Francesca, do you have anything else that you'd like to add to your intro that I might have missed? Um, or you just love all, you. sharing about thank yourself? Thank you for, ha <laughs> for having me. I literally have goosebumps. Her intro was, um, it was beautiful and very complimentary. So thank you. But very surreal because this is one of the first intros being in this new position that I've had and it's like this idea I've had for so long and I'm like it's happening like it's actually happening so no thank you so much for your kind words I really appreciate it I'm so happy I'm here today I know you know when I think of you I think of someone who really truly loves what they do and you're on top of your game like you are on top of it you know I would see your work your floral design work because you weren't doing small things you were doing like big companies you know big hotels like you were their floral designer I think Tiffany's also you were their floral mm. designer so you were on top of your game but before you even went into that how did you start where did you start from where did your journey begin oh my gosh I I want to say that I was kind of like an accidental entrepreneur I I never thought that I would do my own thing or have my own business and it wasn't until I was living overseas and I was an expat and I was just realizing I had kind of climbed the corporate ladder and did all the things that I thought I was supposed to do where I would feel really satisfied. And I just will never forget sitting at my desk one day and like hitting the ejector button on your computer where the little disc would come out over and over. And I was like, this cannot be it. You know, <laughs> it didn't matter how much I was making or how I was living. It was just like, I went to work and I would finish my work so quickly. And then I would just sit there and wonder. And I decided to take the plunge, not realizing it in 2012, so eight years ago. And I started freelancing because I realized there was a lot of money in freelancing more than in my desktop dream job. And I started freelancing, modeling, then I turned into events, and then it turned into destination management. And I would get hired by event companies and go to Istanbul and run huge conferences, $2 million in a weekend. I mean, it was insane. Bill Clinton, Richard Branson, you name it. And thought, well, if I could do this, I could probably start something else. And so I started my first official business, which was in cigar. And not a lot of people know this, but I was, I say a cigar hustler. <laughs> um, I was 20. <laughs> I don't even know, 24? Yeah, 24. And I was promoting Costa Rican cigars in the Middle East because on my father's side, we own a cigar factory in Costa Rica and nobody had ever approached the Middle East market. 
And that's where my entrepreneurial journey began. And it literally started because I am very opportunistic and I just saw an opportunity to try something new. That is so inspiring. I mean, just... (laughs) Even that jump from freelancing to selling cigars, I don't think a lot of people can make that 180 jump because it's intimidating, quite frankly. It's very intimidating. But then even like you thinking, I can't do this, a check button with the CD-ROM. I think in today's world, that would be, I don't know, we can't keep popping things up into cloud. I don't know. But like, yeah. <laughs> but it's so inspiring. So how, what was in your mindset? What was it that you were looking at or thinking at the time when you even jumped from freelancing to cigar selling? You know, I think I had built some confidence. When I left the world of employment as I knew it, I, up until that point, had honestly thought that if I followed the rules and I got the certain degrees and I worked with the certain companies, then I would be worth X amount per year. And then I could build my entire life and lifestyle goals and future dreams on X amount per year. And as I began freelancing, so I remember I would go on my lunch break. And again, I accidentally fell into modeling too. That's like a whole nother story. But my booker would call and say, you've got to go to this uh, audition. And I thought so I'd go on my lunch break. And I remember getting booked for an Emirates shoot. And it was more money in three days than I would make in an entire month of my really lucrative corporate job. And so I think that's when I started realizing that I actually had the power to control what I did and how I was compensated for it. And I just had to kind of figure out what it was that I actually wanted to do. But it gave me the confidence to go out as a freelancer and start negotiating terms that I wanted to work to then saying, what if I took this a step further and actually created something and actually introduced a brand to a brand new region? What would that look like? And each time I've always had this security, so to speak, like when I went into freelancing, I had my corporate job. And then when I built my first business, I had my freelance work. And then when I built my second business, I had my first business. So I, I, I think I just built it and I took the plunge based on the confidence that I have proven to myself in the previous chapter. That's awesome. I mean, I just think the fact you're saying that I built that confidence in me and I also knew that if I can do this, then I can also dictate the terms. And that kind of goes with you saying that you can build a lifestyle that you love. And is that something that you have been doing since the beginning or is that something that's just evolved? So that has evolved. My entrepreneurial journey was definitely my why has always changed depending on the business that I have started. And it wasn't until about a year ago that I realized that my why was never my true why. It was either I felt like I needed to prove something to somebody or prove to myself, or it was somebody else's why that I had somehow adopted for myself that if they thought that that was the best, then surely it had to be the best. And about a year ago, I found myself realizing that what I had built Um, My therapist refers to it as a dollhouse. (laughs) My dollhouse that I had built, I no longer wanted to play with. Like it didn't, the why didn't serve me. And that's when I started really thinking about why is it that people start building businesses? And one of it is for financial gain, but there's so much financial risk in the beginning. It's Mm -hmm. not really about finances and it's not really about success because success means so much to so many different people. It's more so about the lifestyle that it provides us. And so I thought, you know, the next business, and I did not think it was going to happen this fast, but thanks to COVID, I said, I really want to design a business that, that gives me a lifestyle that I love and that other people can learn. And that, that huge point of why we do business is because we actually really love who we work with, what time we wake up, what our morning routine looks like, who we eat lunch with, do we eat dinner with our family? Do we work out at night? I mean, all these small little things. That is part of our lifestyle, and that's what we love about it. Absolutely. I feel like as an entrepreneur, we're able to set our own terms. That doesn't take away that it's a lot of hard work, and it's a lot of sweat, a lot of tears that go into it also. And you don't just leave your work in your office. You totally bring it home, or you sit at home and do the work like I do because of COVID or because of whatever other reason, you know, life happens. And so just to rewind a little bit, though, how did you get into the floral business and from cigars to floral? How did you do that? So I was, it was 2014, so it had been two years now that I had really been 
I was modeling full time. I was freelancing. I was running these huge events, clients with like Chanel and Hermes. Um, I launched Kate Spade in the Middle East. I mean, I was working all the time, hustling my cigars, about to be acquired, and had major burnout. I mean, very, very sick. And I remember just thinking, if I were to die tomorrow, I would be so angry at myself because the thing that drove me at that time was money. How much money can I make? How much money am I worth? Okay, if I can make... I don't know, 15,000 in 10 days. And next time it's going to be 15,000 in five days, whatever it was. It was just a very unhealthy why. And, and so I thought, well, well, what do you want to do? And I knew I had to close all the doors. So I sat, I remember I sat down on my computer one day in a matter of 20 minutes, I canceled all my contracts, all my booking, um, wrote all my clients for the cigar saying that we were restructuring, that we wouldn't be fulfilling any more orders. And I remember closing my laptop and thinking, now what? But at that wow. point, I just knew that if I kept all that noise, I was never going to be able to move forward. And so I took about six months and it was really difficult for someone like me to just take six months off. But I was so sick. I had to take some time to kind of like mentally process what had happened and had this thought I'd always had in the back of my mind flowers flowers. I love flowers. Ever since I can remember, I was doing something with flowers. And so I thought, well, what if I was like a a florist or like a flower designer? I had no idea how to do any of those things. So I remember I Googled how to be a florist, (laughs) how how much do florists make? How do you learn to be a flower designer? And I came across a course and long story short, the next summer I was in LA and I got a master's in flower design and flew back to Dubai and reached out to kind of all my old networks and said, Oh, Hey, by the way, I'm now a flower designer and I help with weddings. And all my event contacts had turned wedding planners overnight. And so they're like, great. And it was a really amazing place to start. And and ironically, my, actually my first client was a Walter Astoria. And I just kept thinking like one day I want to do something with hotels and, so my flower design business started in Dubai in 2015. And then in 2016, we moved to Houston and I just opened shops and thought, okay, now we're in Houston. And a year later, the Fairmont Dallas called and said, we're looking for an artist in residence. So I opened up Dallas. In the matter of, I started in 2015, in a matter of two years, I had three locations, international locations. And it was, that's how I got into the floral world. <laughs> That's amazing. I mean, what I'm really seeing and what like literally leaps out to me are your leaps of faith. You literally just <laughs> took it. You're like, I'm doing it. Yeah. Uh, and I know like that's tough. Even for entrepreneurs who are already entrepreneurs, that's a tough thing because some people are very risk averse also and or they might be in the middle. But I think it's just so amazing. And I also am hearing that a lot of your whys changed. Every time there Mm -hmm. was a transition, your why was changing. But with that changing, though, what is your anchor? What is something that keeps you steady, that keeps you grounded when you do maybe not, you know, fulfill whatever you thought you were going to fulfill or when you do, you know, literally when your, your knees hit the floor and you're just like, I just can't. So what's your anchor at that time? Oh, that's such a good question. I have to say that just my belief in myself, that before I commit to anything, even if it's new, I'm fully aware that I could fail. Like Mm -hmm. it might not work. Someone might not listen. Someone might not buy. Someone might say something mean, all these things. But if I genuinely believe that it's going to help me, if I'm here and it can somehow get me here, or even if it's just here, then it's worth it. And so all my decisions, my anchor is, Will this make me better than yesterday? Will this help me get to a new level of growth? Will this help me achieve a new sense of purpose? And most of the time, yes, because we have these feelings, these callings for a reason. We have these talents for a reason. We're here to help people and connect people to their own talents. And so I'm a big believer in like whatever you're feeling. And sometimes we have too many feelings. So like I said, I have like 20 ideas. Which one do I start with? <laughs> Yes. Um, and I always just say, grab the lowest hanging fruit <laughs> and then you can move your way up the tree. Yeah. Um, my anchor is that I believe that it will help me get to the next level. Um, That's if I feel like it won't, or if it'll keep me status quo, I won't do it. And it's a big reason why I pivoted during COVID because I, I did have that option. 
Yeah. And that's, I think a beautiful gauge also, is it going to make me better? And I think Mm -hmm. a lot of times we lose sight of that because we're not thinking about, is it going to make me better, but is it going to make us money? Like how you had said earlier, it's not about the money because that comes and goes. It ebbs and flows very quickly. And I think what really matters is you and your mindset. I hate to interrupt this awesome conversation, but I have to stop and talk with you about the number one thing I'm asked about by entrepreneurs, contracts. They're vital to any business relationship and to protect your business. But I also know that entrepreneurs, especially when you're starting up, money is tight. But I would never want you to compromise on a strong legal foundation. So enter your contractbuddy.com, a website created by me with contract templates created and drafted by me and fellow industry partners. They're ready to use and easy to plug in immediately. And they are not restricted to any specific state. Yourcontractbuddy.com is sponsoring this episode and you and your listener can get 10% off right now with code LAWCHAT. Yes, you heard me right. 10% off right now with code LAWCHAT. And now back to our awesome conversation. And that kind of takes me into the whole coaching that you've started. I know last year I saw you traveling on your Instagram. You had this amazing feed of lots of travel and it made me really jealous also. I had travel <laughs> envy watching you, but it was beautiful also. And you took some of the most beautiful pictures of yourself you. and, you know, just chronicling your entire travel time. But I know that when COVID started, there was a shift. And so could you okay. kind of like take us through that also? Like when you were traveling, I feel like you were doing something during that time. I just couldn't pinpoint my finger on it. And then the coaching, definitely which is brilliant. Yeah, definitely. So I, last year I had made a promise to myself that in 2020, I would own up to whatever my desire was and trust my gut that I could make a lucrative income from it. And so all of 2019, I completely restructured I got rid of things that were weighing me down. I restructured my team. I restructured the way I work. And it was all for the purpose of being able to finally travel. And um, travel is probably my number one love in life. And I love the idea of being aspirational for other people, to encourage other people to get outside, even if it's good to get outside in their own backyard. Mm -hmm. And so February of this year was the start of my six months. And so we started in Africa. And I was running my floral design business operationally. So I had members on the ground here. And then I had my floral consultancy business, which is a hotel florist, where we help um, hotels with turnkey floral solutions. I was managing that. But I was also trying to turn it into a lifestyle brand that encouraged flowers, hotels, and travel. Those are my three focuses. And and then on March 24th, we (laughs) flew home from Australia and had a, I think think it was a 40-day stay-at-home ban. And quickly realized that uh, hotels, flowers, and travel were not going to come back anytime soon. And that I had built basically this brand for no reason. And it was really a struggle for about a week. And just thought to myself, okay, you have two choices. I was, my DMs were blowing up. Like, let's do Mother's Day arrangements. Let's do Easter arrangements. Let's do drop-off orders. And I just thought, you know what? And there's nothing wrong with that. That just wasn't in my heart. I started my business like that. I did that in the past. But I had moved on from that, that level. Like that, that was down here. That was like three years ago, Francesca. And I wanted to get to like where I wanted to be in, in the next five years. So I made that really hard decision where I was like, well, it now is time. And it's very ironic because I had already started masterminding calls in January to build this coaching program and just kept asking myself, like, when am I ever going to have time to build this? I had a lot of time in April. And I just focused on that. And so I created a whole new brand, FrancescaMcCohen.com. And I launched a business system that's specifically on designing a business to give you a lifestyle you love. I'm actually running a free masterclass next week. So I'm constantly trying to think of other resources I can give. Because even though I offer a lot of education on the floral side, right now what I specialize in, corporate. So that's being a corporate florist with like Tiffany & Co. We were their Texas florist, seven stores, hotel florist. Nobody is needing those services right now. And I just didn't feel ethical to promote that. So I thought, I want to help people that really need help right now that have possibly been laid off, are questioning their careers, they're at home now, but they're realizing, wow, like, I really like it at home. What is it going to be like when we go back to the new normal, etc. Whereas, and then my floral 
education can wait until another time when the market's back. So that's why and how I have pivoted kind of now in this new mentorship and coaching role from travel influencer to business coach. It's been a lot. It's been a lot this year. <laughs> Honestly, though, I feel like a whole year has passed since January. A lot's happened. I know. <laughs> so, I mean, it is what it is. But, you know, I find it very inspiring, though, how you have something in your heart you already know that you've passed a certain point and that you're ready to move forward. And I think it's so inspiring to have such a strong mindset of knowledge and also believing in yourself as well, because pivoting is not easy. And a lot mm -hmm. of people had to pivot during COVID time and during quarantine, and they're still having to pivot in the next six months. Many people will pivot again. And I think it's so beautiful that you were able to see that. You already knew it. You saw the opportunity. Mm. And you're like, I'm just going to jump on it. So if there's some tips, I'm going to ask you for two sets of tips now. The first set of tips, though, is what are some tips on helping that mindset to shift to pivot? Do you have any tips on that? Absolutely. I mean, I have a lot of different psychology-backed exercises that I actually have in my course because these things have really helped me. Right. But I'd say in that moment, probably the thing that made me so true to myself is I asked myself, does this decision come from a place of scarcity? So when I'm getting all these DMs and people calling like, Hey, could you do a mother's day arrangement for me? Can you do Easter? Can we do drop off? I thought, am I taking this because I'm worried when I might see another penny or am I taking this because I genuinely would love the opportunity to do this? And if my feeling is I'm taking this for the money, then it's coming from a place of scarcity because I'm basically okay. telling myself, I don't trust myself. I don't know when you're going to be back in the driver's seat. So we're going to take whatever we can get now. I think that's a big mistake that a lot of people make instead of just having full confidence. And so what I did is actually I found florists who have been laid off and had started their own businesses overnight. And I would just send them all those leads. Like, I'm not doing this, but you know what? So-and-so is, and they're awesome. I would order from them. And it was a huge boost to them. And for me, I just believe in karma. I was like, yeah. I'm not going to do that business because I genuinely don't want to. But I know somebody who does, and I'm a facilitator. So it's always like come to me to go to someone else. That would be my number one tip is to, when you're making decisions, when it comes to pivoting, ask yourself, does this place come from a place of scarcity? It could also be like how comfortable you are with something. Pivoting is not easy. And we typically stay in a comfort zone. So if we feel like we're constantly wanting results or not getting, we need to look at the thought that we're having. Because we're having a certain feeling. It's giving us a thought, which is giving us an action equals a result. So are those feelings coming from a place of scarcity? And then dig into that. Like, what is the belief behind that? So that would be my tip for pivoting for sure. I love that. I think we all are so inclined to getting a scarcity mindset sometimes, and we don't even know it that we're living in no. that. And it's so nice to be thoughtful about it and to also have that acknowledgement that that could be happening. So I think that's a wonderful mm. thing to point out. So the next thing I'm going to ask you actually is your tips on how to live a lifestyle that you love and building a business or a lifestyle centered around the lifestyle that you love. Any tips on that? Oh, that's like a two part question. I'd say if someone's looking to just, maybe they're like, I don't know what kind of lifestyle I even want. I would start saying like, create your structure. What do you want your mornings to feel like? Or what do you want them to look like? Do you wake up and you look out the window and you watch the sunrise with a cup of coffee? Do you sleep in? Do you go for a run with your husband in the morning like, or your partner? Like, what, did, what do you want your morning to look and feel like? And then once you figure that out, what do you want your night to look and feel like? I have very strong rituals for both that have just evolved with time because they made me feel good. It wasn't necessarily because that's what someone told me I should or shouldn't do. It's just like what made me feel good, what I wanted it to look like. If somebody were to look inside your window, if you were to look in someone's window, would you have FOMO about their lifestyle? And then you can figure out everything in between. That's the part. That's the business part. And then when it comes to how do you design a business to give you a lifestyle you love, I'll give you an example. Recently, one of my students, she came in and she had like these amazing ideas when it comes to starting a bakery. And they all require different things. So we narrowed it down to three. And then like one required a commercial kitchen, one required like a fleet of cars for delivery, and then one required like a food truck. 
but I know this person. This person, her ultimate lifestyle is to be free and travel. And I asked her, I said, when in all of this, these three options, are you going to be able to have that freedom? Because to have a commitment of a fleet of cars or a food truck or et cetera, and especially look at, and this is the amazing thing about COVID. That's why I think it's the perfect time to design your business. It's because it's shown us where the gaps are, like where we weren't strong. So I said, look, there's obviously a business in feeding people. Restaurants have suffered. Grocery stores have thrived. It's figuring out where you play your part in this and to ensure that it's actually going to give you the lifestyle you love. Because what a lot of entrepreneurs do is they go in there, they get their money, and then they build a cage. They build their own box. And they don't have a lifestyle they love. They have a lifestyle they want to escape from. And that's, that's not why we're doing it. And so I'd say the first part is create your own structure. And then the second is really think about your why that supports this lifestyle and then design your business around that. I love that. I'm like thinking about my own business now. (laughs) (laughs) Honestly, it's good food for thought. I mean, I think it's so impressive that you've just shifted into the coaching aspect. And now you, you know, I I was reading on your website, on your website itself, and it said that Francesca means free one. And it's so beautiful that you're helping others develop a lifestyle that is freeing, that is allowing them Mm. to live in the way that they want to live, but yet earn income and money and provide for themselves and their family. So I think that is just so beautiful. Absolutely. I mean, I'll never forget coming home with that little sign. I think I was kindergarten and I was like look at my name means free one and I had no idea what that meant until the other day I was looking through a numerology report and it came out again and it's all about free and but I built businesses that were nothing they were like completely opposite of free and there is a reason why I felt suffocated in them so it's very important that we stay true to ourselves because this is where genuine happiness comes from right and then I feel like you can transfer that to your clients also then and into your work When you're happy, it transfers into the work that you're doing and it really resonates. I think it speaks volumes. Like when you're genuine about what you're doing and you're genuine to what you're doing, then it does speak volumes also about who you are and your business. And it's attractive. It naturally is attractive to (laughs) others. It is. I I love it. I think it's amazing. I mean, I love hearing, you know, your journey. I love hearing all the different steps and the pivots that you made and how much boldness you had and the mindset was so strong on your side as well. And I hope that, you know, people who are listening will get inspired by that because sometimes, you know, I know that a lot of people don't believe that entrepreneurship is for them, but I know you have a different belief on that. Can you share with us what you think on that? Absolutely. So I'll never forget. And by no means was I very close with either one of my parents, but I'll never forget a phrase that my dad told me once that he said, Francesca, there's two types of people. There's employers and employees. And I just thought, well, that's just not possible. That's very discriminatory. But it actually, it makes sense because like I could never really imagine being an employee again after being an employer. And it's not that one is better than the other. This is another thing that I think last year it really came out that it was like trendy to be an entrepreneur. And if you weren't an entrepreneur and successful, then you were like a loser basically. Mm -hmm. And I think entrepreneurialism kind of got a bad rep because of that. So it's ultimately really what is it that you love doing? What is your strength? Do you want this freedom? Some people don't. And that's perfectly okay. Some people love being somebody's number two, like my best friend. She's like, I would never want to do my own thing. Everyone's personality is different. But if you do have that inkling to go out on your own, it doesn't have to be scary. It doesn't have to be so exclusive. It literally is just if you can show up for yourself, which you probably have up until this point, or you wouldn't be here and you're ready to put in the hard work because you truly believe in whatever it is that you want to do. And you can figure out how to make money doing anything. I mean, especially in this day and age with the internet, especially everything that we have now at our fingertips in the digital Mm -hmm. world, how we're so connected. Yeah. So entrepreneurialism for me is for anybody who feels called to it. I agree with you too. I think it's, it's such a different mindset and I come from an entrepreneurial family and it's generational entrepreneurial and I've fortunately married into one also because I think if I hadn't, we might have had a little difference of mm. mindset and thinking and approach to certain things. Not that one is bad or one is not bad or one is better or not, but it's just a different way of looking at stuff as a, your lens Absolutely. is different. And I also cannot imagine myself working for a big law firm or any law firm, 
for that matter, just yeah. because I feel like I'm creating a brand that is so different mm-hmm. from an ordinary law firm, but I'm getting so much out of it, like on a personal yeah. level. And I'm getting to help people who truly need help and not just the big corporate companies that need help, but you know, small businesses mm-hmm. that make up our country and our community, they need help. And I'm so happy that I'm able to do that for them too, but in a Absolutely. way where you can embrace it. Mm-hmm. And you have a feeling of purpose. You can still support your family. Money is a lot of people look at money as like a good thing or a bad thing. It either gives you survival or it gives you too much. And money is really just a resource to get to your ultimate desire. So I remember when we first worked together in the school design business, I really had never heard of a big corporate lawyer helping small businesses. In fact, when I first started, which was only a couple years before that, I couldn't even figure out who could look at my contract without charging me like a thousand dollars. And so I think what you're doing is one, so helpful, two, so fulfilling, and three, like the money comes, but the money comes from everyone. And that's the great thing is because then you become a facilitator for somebody yeah. else. Uh, so I love what you're doing. I'm so happy that you're doing it. So yeah, don't go anywhere. <laughs> I, am, I don't plan on it. I plan on being around for a while. So while we're talking about law and this is Law Chat, so let's talk about some law in your business. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> tell me, tell us, where were you like, oh my gosh, I really wish I had done something about this with regards to law that you had taken those steps beforehand or you were in some situation you're just like, oh my gosh, I just wish... Honestly, it's like, I wish I'd taken care of this beforehand and not yeah. not beat this an afterthought. <laughs> I don't think I realized how quickly I grew and kind of how much I had exposed. But the one thing is, is I really, my pet peeve is like problems. My number one strength is problem solving. But when there's a problem, I'm instantly honed in onto what the problem is and why it happened and how can I prevent it from happening again. And so there was two particular instances where I didn't feel protected from a client and I didn't feel protected from an employee. And that's when I thought, okay, I need to get someone in. I need to find the resources, get someone in and help me review my contracts. I had contracts, but they were like contracts from like a CRM system or a contract that I had found and kind of piecemealed together, like all new um, entrepreneurs do. And just thought, I'll deal with that later when it happens. And then it happens and then you deal with it. So definitely having you as a resource was so helpful because I remember there was a time I was renegotiating a contract and they redlined the entire thing and sent it back <laughs> to me to change. And I was like, no, I'm not, I'm not changing this because this doesn't protect me or my business. And I remember getting in a huge fight with my husband about this. And he was like, just take it. You know, it's fine. It'll work out. And I'm like, it's not fine because that would be irresponsible. I have employees that rely on this money. I rely on this money and this, these terms. I build my business based on the amount of clients I take every year. So it gave me, again, a sense of confidence. And I think this is so important for business owners to figure out what gives you confidence to stand up for what your worth is. And so I still won that contract. I didn't change a thing in that contract. And I went to bed every night knowing that we were covered. Everything was going to be fine. Now that I'm getting into a new business, I'm quickly seeing how much content is just ripped off. (laughs) Yes. And it's kind of annoying. Uh, it's a bit of a free for all out there. So I will definitely be engaging in more services. I know you have so many resources out there already, but definitely legal. People don't realize how fast they grow and how quickly they need it. And so it should definitely be a priority, just like a bookkeeper. Yeah, that's my whole goal with my practice also is to make legal a line item and not a panic attack. Because honestly, yeah. like, because, <laughs> you know, when someone does steal something from you, because now you're coaching and you're creating all mm-hmm. this content and you have to also put out this content for free because you want people to understand what you're building and whether it resonates with them. But then a lot of people will just take it and make it their own and literally verbatim even to copycat you. So that's a huge issue in the creative world is copycats. So yes, that is something that you should definitely take care of from the front (laughs) end and not after the problem because it's tough. It's It's tough to take care of. It's on my to-do list for sure. Yeah. (laughs) Well, you just started the business so we can have a chat later on about that. (laughs) (laughs) but like I said I'm already seeing a need for it though you know it's like I think you started talking to coaches maybe about a month ago and I was like oh this is great when I'm there I'm going to come back to this and then literally every day I see something that's like like it's literally like on the top of my to-do list now because it is 
really important, especially when you're building something, it is your responsibility to protect it. You wouldn't like build a house and then not put any locks on your doors or any windows and expect nobody to break in. Like, you have to, you have to protect yourself. Yeah, absolutely. It's preventative. And also to mitigate anything that could happen because you can still have somebody break in, but you're mitigating sure. the damage that is happening also. And so with that segue, what are some challenges other than legal that you faced or some that stand out and how did you overcome them? Definitely fear of losing money <laughs> was a challenge. And I think that's like a challenge for a lot of people. And I overcame that by setting myself really strict budget. So I remember when I first moved to Houston, I was a little fish in a pretty big established pond. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to go in with a bang. I want people to know I'm here. And so I rented in one of the most, I rented in the most exclusive neighborhood and I set aside the rent money for that. And I thought, okay, you've got six months till it runs out. And if mm -hmm. it runs out, then maybe you do something else. And so I didn't have that fear anymore because I kind of like set myself a deadline. Now I'll tell you the month before it ran out, I told a friend, I was like, I'm not going to make it. I'm going to have clothes and I'm so mortified. And I was like, but I'm going to give it like a 30 extra day push. And I kid you not, I booked my first six, six figure client like two weeks later. Amazing. Um, and so I think it's just that fear of money was a big challenge, but that's how I negotiated that. Legal was a challenge just because we're creators, you know, we're, we don't really think about what mm -hmm. we need to protect so that people would even want to hurt us because we wouldn't, they're not, they're not hurting us, but they, anybody would have their best interest at mind because we have ours at mind. Yeah. And probably the third thing is the challenge of thinking I could do it all that, you know, I'm, oh, I yeah. do very well multitasking. I'm pretty on top of everything, but it wanted to not give you the lifestyle you love trying to do it all. But also I'm not great at everything. I might be a six or a seven or in some areas I might even be a nine, but in other areas I might be a two. And so when I quickly started realizing either what my weaknesses were or what I really didn't like doing, and I could delegate that to somebody who did like doing those things or were really good at those things, my business thrived versus mm -hmm. to thrive. Yeah. I think delegation is key especially the Absolutely. minute you started growing up. So that's awesome. I love that you were talking about the budget and how to negotiate because we all have those fears. Having the tools and learning to face on, head on, you know, mitigate them or negotiate with them is really helpful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I love that. So I know that, you know, you've gone from floral design to now coaching. How are you disrupting the industry? I feel like you are, but I want to hear from you. <laughs> How are you disrupting the industry? What are you doing that is like shaking it up a little bit? Oh my gosh. This is going to sound really cliche, but just being authentically me. I'm not coming in promising someone unrealistic results or millions of dollars. I am not coming in promising things I can't deliver in the sense that I'm seeing a lot of business coaches have never even owned a business. Their mm -hmm. business coaching is their business. And I understand that's a business, but like I've had a lot of, I've fallen on my face a lot and I've succeeded a lot and I'm genuinely showing up to share everything that I know because I want to help other people. I'm like, it's, it's like that quote, you know, teach a man to fish and he'll never be hungry. And for me, I feel like that's how I'm disrupting it. I'm off my main deep desire is to live a lifestyle you love. And Nobody has really talked about that up until now because it's all been about titles, salaries, how many places you visited, how many homes you own, what kind of car you drive. And those things feel good. I'm not just diminishing that. But the fact is nobody has really talked about a lifestyle until we've all been sat home now for months and realizing that when was the last time that we ate dinner as a family? Or when was the last time I was able to put my kids to bed seven nights in a row or like these are small things that yeah. all of a sudden aren't normal anymore. And they're like the core of us. That's the reason why we have families or that's the reason why we have homes to be in them. So I think how I'm shaking it up is that I'm making the deep desire a lifestyle you love. Mm -hmm. And I haven't really seen too many people do that, but I also put my blinders on when it comes to anybody in my niche and it's still a weird concept like business coach because I was like I don't have a certificate I'm like what do you need a certificate for you're just helping people design businesses um, and so that's oh I'm you have a lot of experience and I think that speaks volumes you know anybody can be a business coach like you said but if they don't have experience then you have to really wonder what value they're giving yeah 
and an experience in like multiple levels and multiple segments and multiple countries mm-hmm. as a multiple person. Like when I started in the Middle East, I was an expat. Houston, I moved to a new city. I mean, I've done a lot of breakthroughs and a lot of new things and I've never stayed in just one path. Yeah. And I, so I think that's probably what a big differentiator. Yeah. And I think what you're doing right now is so true because I feel like time stopped for everybody in the world because we were running so fast. And this was a very deliberate time stop that happened. That was totally out of our control, but it was so that we could regroup and reframe Mm -hmm. and rejuvenate Mm -hmm. because it it truly was amazing. Like, and I also know that I speak from a place of a lot of privilege where when I say that it was an amazing experience (laughs) to be in quarantine, I know that's not true for everybody. And, you know, but I do feel like there, that time was there so you could reassess what is important and what is not important. So and I like, think it's, how do you grow? How do you grow to the new normal? Because old normal is not coming back. Oh, no, no, no. It's a different life now that we're all going to be living for at least the next yeah. two years, at least. Yeah. So tell me, I'm going to do some rapid fire questions of fun facts. Okay. Like, what's your favorite book? It's 101 Essays That Will Change the Way You Think. It's mm. by uh, Brianna West. And I literally read it every single night, like one page, and it is just so deep, so to mm. the point. I love this book. I am getting it. Can you get it on Amazon? Oh, yeah. That okay. and Profit First. And if you go to my website, there there are links there under my books. I have a whole book club that oh, wow. knows about, but it's there. What's your <laughs> yeah. favorite magazine or blog? Oh, um, probably Condé Nast. Travel. I love, I love that. I, I love that. Yeah. Travel magazines are like awesome. You may yeah. they just take you to another world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then what's your favorite biz tools, apps, or resources that you love? You can't live without. I use Lightroom almost every day. That's for editing photos. And I love Zoom. I'm on Zoom almost yeah. every day. Yeah. And probably Instagram. Yeah. Lightroom. I hang out with people in my DMs more than I really want to admit. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. So how can we find you? I know you said Instagram, but how can listeners and viewers who are just in love with your lifestyle and creating that brand, how can we find you? So I have a lot of fun stuff on my website, which is francescamacohen.com. That's anything from the hotel floors to lifestyle you love business system. I also have a whole fashion area, I have my book area. Anyway, that's like my fun website. And then Instagram, francesca.mcohen. That's it. And I've got well, YouTube and all the other things. But. Well, I'm going to put all the links in the show notes so everybody can get access to you and find you. And, you know, I've just had such a great time learning more about you and your journey. Okay. And it was so inspiring to hear you oh speak. God, thank you. And I mean, honestly, like having somebody like you as a cheerleader next to them and telling them you can do it is game changing. So I'm so thank excited you. to see where your coaching business takes you. Me thank too, you, friend. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining Law Chat with Gerja. I love these kind of stories and conversations where we can be real, honest, and open and having fun at the same time. I hope you are inspired and motivated to keep doing the amazing work you are doing. If this is something that gave you all those feels and then some, truly motivated and inspired for you. You can show your love in all or one of these ways. Be sure to give this video a thumbs up, subscribe, and share this video with your community and tell them about it or share with somebody that can benefit from it. I look forward to seeing you next time on another episode of Law Chat. And until then, keep moving forward. Bye. Mm -hmm.